Parker. It uh, is one o'clock, and you're here if you came for the leadership session. My name is Larry Davenport. Uh, amongst other things, I'm a retiring Board of Governors member this year. I'm also the chairman of the Program Policy Committee and uh, a caller, lab member, obviously. To my left is Gene Triplett, and he is, what's the official title? The What is the head of the NEC called? The NEC. <laughs> well, but do you have any particular title that goes with it? It's the uh, National Executive Committee of the National Square Dance Conventions. National Executive Committee of the National Square Dance Convention, but you're also the chairman, or? No, I'm uh, just a uh, director, and I'm an uh, uh, advisor to Squares, Youth, Contour, and Clock. Well, aren't you? I'm just a um, member and have been a member of the National Executive Committee for about 10 years. Um, my wife and I serve as uh, advisors to Squares, Youth, clogging, and um, uh, Contra. And Connie is also the circulation manager for the National Squares magazine. So if you have any problems in getting your magazine, that's who you complain to. And and Connie, wave to the crowd, and she has agreed to be our floor monitor and to carry the microphone around. Because uh, when Gene and I were talking and Connie and I were talking about this thing, uh, we could try to figure out how to talk to you for an hour and I'm not sure anybody really wants to hear from, from us for an hour. Um, but what I'd like to do is, is make sure that this is an interactive session and uh, so that uh, questions, comments, uh, suggestions, or other things that uh, as we talk a little bit from the front come up. i uh, love to see some hands go up in the air, and that's where Connie will get the microphone to you. Um, part of uh, the reason I think that I'm on the, uh, uh, this as the moderator of the um, uh, leadership session is, is that one of the things I do in my other professional life besides square dance calling is, is uh, leading teams and facilitating uh, meetings and uh, uh, providing uh, decision-making is something I do in my, my professional life with a company by the name of Genentech uh, uh, near San Francisco. So... Um, I want to talk, and also I'm a, uh, to just talk where I'm coming from. I'm also a local club caller. I'm not a regional traveling caller. I'm not a national caller. Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, I currently, uh, up until last year, I called for three clubs in the area. I currently now call for one club because I retired from two clubs this last year because that other piece I mentioned, Genentech, is taking more and more of my time. But uh, the three clubs that I called for, the one club I currently call for, are all dancer-run organizations. And so you're going to find the gamut out there. Some of you uh, are running the clubs as a caller-run club. Some of them are run by by dancers. Sometimes there's some type of a, a, a hybrid, perhaps. Uh, maybe we hear some more people. Uh, but from a calling point of, point of view, uh, the caller sometimes is... Uh, more, provides more continuity to the organization than the changing members of the uh, leadership on the dancer side. And so callers, whether they are part of the formal leadership team of the club or whether they're informal consultants to the, uh, of the, of that team, it's very important to realize that you have a leadership position. It's very important to realize that you have an obligation for effective partnership, uh, with that, with that club because you're all in it for the same thing. Thing, dancer and color alike, you're in there for the success of the activity and the success of the club. And so um, uh, we can talk about uh, some of the ways that partnering might might make sense. Uh, just from my own personal uh, experience with square dance clubs, I would say that uh, for the three clubs that I've called up, I've called for most recently, that uh, they all have a dancer organization for running the club. Uh, they've all looked to me as as to what do I want my role to be. Uh, they've let me decide whether I'm going to sit in on the on the board meetings or not sit in on the board meetings. I've actually chosen in my circumstances not to sit in on the board meetings, but to be there as a uh, as a consultant for the club, as a partner for the club. If they want ideas from me to provide ideas, if I see some things that they might want to know about as options they have, I can provide them. But I think what I'm trying to say in that is is it's really important uh, 
uh, from that leadership position, from a caller's point of view, is to not dictate to the club what they should or should not be doing, but to really see it as a partnership and work with them uh, so that you get mutual success for everybody. So that's an area that we can explore a little bit further as we get into this session and um, uh, are able to maybe get some other comments or, or ask some questions. And I think that Gene has some opening remarks as well that he'd like to make. When Gail called me from Florida and asked me if I would serve on the panel, I did something that I used to think um, it always seemed silly when I would be sitting out in the audience and someone would set up there and said the first thing I did is I went to the dictionary to see what the word leadership meant. And I always thought that was kind of silly, but as soon as Gail called me, that's the first thing I did. I went to Webster's Dictionary. And it said the leader or leadership was a capacity or ability to lead. But it also said something that I disagreed with and said it is the position or office of a leader, as a leader. And I've known a lot of people who were leaders or in a position to lead and couldn't lead. So it goes to the phrase that you used to hear a lot was, Either lead, follow, or get the heck out of the way. And uh, so in my, I feel like there's two types of leaders. One is a emotional leader, and you hear about the emotional leader of a, a basketball, football team, and he's the raw, raw guy who gets out there and gets everybody psyched up and ready to go. And um, he gets the job done just through his emotions and everything, or her emotions. Then you have the participation leader, the leader who participates, and he does a lot of the work. But in doing that, he encourages the other people to come in and work with him. And both leaders get the job done. They just get it done in a different way. And so I asked my question. I said, what type of leader was I? Because I never felt like I was a leader until someone told me one day. And uh, so... I, I think I do it by getting out there and working with the people. And I feel like that um, if I do part of the load, then I don't feel bad about asking someone else to do a part of it. So I think it you can be one or the other, but as long as you're out there, you need to be able to see that the job gets done. And in our club back home, our caller is a big part of our club. He attends most of our most of the meetings with the officers. He participates on uh, some of the decision making, but also he lets the club officers run the club the way they feel it should be run. So, um, a leader to me is just someone that gets the job done, regardless of how he does it or how they go about it. So, we'll take some questions. Does anybody want to talk about uh, uh, the kinds of leadership or the kinds of uh, uh, club leadership situations that they currently work with? And, and if, if you're going to get the microphone for the for the recording, and if you'd also please state your name and where you're from. Okay. I'm Lori Tucker. Uh, live up in the Bay Area. I'm on the board of directors of two clubs up there. I'm not a caller. Uh, I've been dancing a little under four years. Um, Actually, I'm in three clubs. Uh, one that dances uh, predominantly uh, mainstream plus, another one that's plus uh, advanced, and another one that uh, dances C1. Um, one of the issues we're dealing with in in our uh, uh, clubs that dance mainstream and plus, plus and advanced is trying to determine at what point in time recognizing that square dancing is supposed to be fun for everybody in the club. What point in time do you work with the caller and within the board of determining that a new dancer in the club um, is really not progressing at, you know, at the rate or, or uh, uh, speed, uh, getting up to... Um, that point in their, in their dancing career that they can effectively dance with the other people in the club without constantly crashing squares. And uh, we've got a couple situations in, in two of these clubs that are exactly that way. And we're interested in how 
you handle it in your clubs as a caller or any of you that may be in the leadership of your club when you run into this situation? Right. So let me comment first. That, that's always a kind of a difficult situation that might come up. And in terms of when does the caller and club leadership work together, they should constantly be working together so that it's not just coming together to solve those types of things. Um, between the caller and the dancer leadership, you need to know what you want your club to be. You need to know what your your culture of your club is, um, and and you you need to know uh, you know what's going to add to the health of the club and what might not add to the health of the club, because when you get into those situations, you need to sort of have that common background of of so what is your basis for for even approaching that kind of a com- a, a, a conversation. Uh, we all like to think that square dancing is something for everybody. Uh, within each individual club. Um, there may be some people that it's just not the right experience for. That can happen. You have to decide how to do that. Um, there are no easy answers. They're almost case by case. In a sense, I, I would like to think that square dancing is for pretty much everybody, but uh, where you, you are going to fit the best in that activity may be different club culture, different club level, different club environment, different whatever. So if you've got an individual uh, that is not going to make it in your club, uh, you, one of the solutions is to think about, but is there another area where, where that's what that club does and that's where they can fit? Um, because you're always balancing the needs of the individual and the needs of the club uh, to, to put some contrast on the table, if you will, uh, just to sort of make it obvious. Uh, everybody is happy to dance at this level, and so everybody has to dance at this level, and then you don't have this kind of problem. Uh, you got somebody that's coming in that just can't dance at that level. Well, if philo- philosophically speaking, that's not going to help. You've got to think about what's the obligation to the club to keep those people happy, and what's the, what's the obligation to the individual dancer or dancer couple for their, you know, for what's going to work best for them? You do, I have reached situations where it's just not going to work and you try, what we have tried in the clubs where I've done this is to have those discussions, have those discussions early, myself as a caller to give extra attention. To helping them if their if their if their um, uh, learning curve is different than the rest of the class, is there a way that uh, you can work with them to give them a little extra time? If the caller doesn't have the extra time in terms of what they're doing in the evening, if you've got and I've had uh, the blessing, if you will, of of some of the club uh, indivi- club members who were um, uh, able to provide a teaching experience in a walkthrough mode, and so for instance, these people may be out in the hallway getting extra instruction, and then I work with them to see how it folds in. Uh, so you you have an opportunity not to make an immediate decision in some cases, but you have the opportunity to see if there's a solution that works within the club. Um, between the club leadership and the caller, there should be an understanding of who needs to talk to the to the couple in, in realistic terms. Is that the caller? Is that the club leadership or some combination? That's something you need to work out in the way that you work together as a club. And one has to sort of acknowledge to these people that it's not really working uh, uh, for you, is it? Because sometimes uh, sometimes people, uh, you, you might hesitate from that difficult conversation, if you will, but sometimes just having that kind of conversation is the only way to approach it. You can't ignore it. You'd, you'd, the worst case to me is if you ignore it and wait until they finally just have had enough and they don't come back because that doesn't do anything good for them. It doesn't do anything good for the club environment that you've just ignored it. I think you have to proactively decide from a leadership point of view how to deal with that. At the end of the day, you may have some hurt feelings that can't be avoided, but if you've at least provided the basis of where the club is, uh, the, if you've decided that the club values are, are, are what need to be adhered to and that they're, they're representative and they're fair, uh, you, you just have to walk down that path and take it where it goes sometimes. And sometimes you may be able to direct somebody and say, oh, thank you, I didn't know there was this group over here that I could work with or, or what have you. Uh, I've seen it both ways. They're difficult situations, but you at least have to start from that grounding. Gene, do you have any thoughts or comments on that kind of a situation from your perspective? I think you have to look at the dancers or the people that are there and what type of temperament are they um, – do you have someone on the as an officer that say relates to that person better than the other one? Um, 
It may be a situation where you could just get a fellow dancer who is maybe friends with these people and just have them go and talk with them rather than to someone who is doesn't have a good people's uh, charm or workability. You know, couldn't work with people real well. Rather than, but just get someone in the club that could go speak with them, and possibly friends. We've had, uh, we got a class going right now, and for the first time in several years, I've been angeling. Um, and so I was over, we finished our 10th week, Monday a week ago, and we had one couple, the lady had been having a lot of trouble. And she came up to me, and she said, this will be my last night. She said, my husband and I have decided that I'm not going to be able to do it. And so they took themselves out. So this worry, this helps you out a lot of times. But if they're having trouble getting it, I don't think you need to wait until they graduate. No, you need to move them before then. And either you do it, your officers do it, or the callers. It's just a choice you have to make. It just depends on who has the people skills that can go and do it. Yeah, I, I ditto on that really important stuff. Um, one of the things I meant to say about it is if you've got these situations, you, you shouldn't be judging too soon. You should be looking at the problem to deal with it. I have seen, and I've been calling and teaching for 23 years, I've seen situations where at some point I, I've, I've spotted dancers in new classes that I had my doubts as whether they would ever make it. Some of them, I had my doubts. I, I, it wasn't doubts. I was sure they would never make it. And if, if myself and the club leadership had made an early judgment, those people would not have made it. And, and I don't know what the percentage, but the percentage is pretty high of those people who did make it because we didn't prejudge, we didn't judge too early, and we did the things that allowed us to know during the class period that they were going to make it. They weren't going to get ahead. So I, to I totally agree. You don't let the problem go, graduate it, and then say it's not my problem anymore. I, I totally agree with that, but it's it's interesting how uh, what appears to be an impossible situation at first, if you work with it proactively and work with it as combined leadership, you can find solutions. One thing, if they would have judged me early in our classes, I wouldn't be here today because the first six, eight weeks, I had a lot of problems uh, with learning it, and uh, we used to tape our class and I would take it with me, and as I was traveling around, I would listen to it in the car, the, the explanation of the call, and him calling our caller, doing it on the, you know, on the tape. And it's amazing what that will reinforce in your mind. And uh, so they stuck with me, and I, uh, and I went on to graduate, uh, thanks to my wife. She, she pulled me through, and still pulling me through. Um, how many of our folks out there are callers in this room? How many others are partners? How many others are just classify yourself as you're here and your dancers? Great. So we got a nice mix all over the place. Um, from a caller's point of view, in, in terms of assessing what's happening on the floor, if you do the things I was talking about and work with the people the extra time and do all those other things, you tend to know you're getting to that point that you're going to have to make a decision when you realize that uh, the the progress of the class in general has, has just sort of bogged down to a point where other class members are getting frustrated that they feel like they're going over the same material time and time again. So if you cater to the to the people, that after, after you've gone through this process, if you've catered to the people that just this is not where their success is going to be, uh, you, chan you stand the chance of losing a lot of other people uh, because, and then so that's that's part of it. Do any of the colors out there resonate with the idea that you can pretty much spot when, when, when you've really got to take action for a final decision? Anybody want to comment on how they do that? No hands. Any other? I think we've – does that give you some helpful thoughts? Great. Uh, are there any other topics? Anybody want to talk about the kind of leadership situation that they're in to share with the group or, or other areas that you would like us to explore as from our experience? Right over here. Uh, I'm Art Parks. Uh, from Covina, California, and I, and I might just say that uh, I've been a former club officer, uh, president, secretary, that kind of stuff, as well as uh, 
association chairman. Um, and I'm seeing a phenomena involve, evolving now in our area out where we live. That is to say that increasingly clubs that were once dancer run are going to well no let me let me rephrase that another way what i what i'd like to do is find out um the history of uh, collar run clubs where do they come from the history of collar run clubs <clears throat> I don't know that I'm qualified to be the historian on that subject, but I do have some thoughts on it. Uh, one of the best ways for a new caller to get into calling is to find a group of people and start calling to them. Um, in, in that sense, uh, you have the genesis of a caller-run club, uh, a caller that wants to, you know, it's, it's a little tough for a caller to call to an empty room. In the same way, it's a little difficult for a group of dancers with no tapes, no records, or no caller to, to really have a meaningful dancing experience. So I mean, it, it takes all of us. But I think initially, um, a lot of caller run clubs were started because the caller started the club. Uh, in other cases, um, uh, another scenario might be that at some point it may become a dancer run club because that caller uh, may have left to do something else and the club wants to stay alive and so they form leadership and they get another caller to come in there and now it, it, it may be a dancer run club. Uh, in other cases, uh, the caller may not have left but there's a lot of work to do in running a club and so any smart caller running a caller run club <coughs> still wants volunteers that will assist them and in time it may make more sense for the volunteers to become the leadership than the caller themselves. So there are various ways that can happen. A, a dancer run club may revert to a caller run club because it runs out of the energy to provide the leadership. And if the caller wants to keep the uh, the club going uh, and the dancers say, you know, we don't want to do this anymore. Would you just please, you know, show up, open up the door, put up your equipment, call, you collect the money, we want to be here to dance. That happens as well. So I think that's some of the, some of how we get there. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. Microphone back if you got some additional comments on that. Well, only that then that's the reason I posed the question. Um, I'm seeing that that clubs that were previously dancer dancer run, they've they've the leadership has aged, the the members have aged. Nobody wants to do squat, and so technical term, right? Squat. <laughs> <laughs> and so they they kind of just hand it to a caller. Um, to take it to, to just take it over so that they don't have to think they still about want it. to dance they still want to dance in the same place but they yeah. don't want to have to take care of some of those things yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it and from from where I've my background and where I've come from it looks like a red flag like I don't see how they're ever going to improve their organization unless the unless the Unless the caller, I suppose, comes in and re-motivates the whole situation. Well, well, somebody has to have, whether it be the dancer leadership or the caller, and, and please take this thing away from me, Gene, when you're ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, has to have the interest and has to have the passion. So the, the fact of the matter is, one way you can describe that is, is the dancers have lost the passion for running their club, but they haven't lost the desire to dance. If you get, and, and to me, as long as the, the dancers and the callers are working together in a club situation, uh, I can see a scenario where caller leadership will work. I see a scenario where dancer leadership will work and some kind of a, of a hybrid in between the two will work. It's really when people are working towards the same ends. And, and out of that group, if it's, if it's not the dancers who, anymore, if you have a caller that's got the passion, then you've got something going and you may be able to grow it. But if you've got a caller that just comes in and calls but doesn't have the passion to grow it, and if you've got a dancer organization, that club's leadership, that wants to come in and dance but doesn't have the passion to grow it, then what you basically have is a club that's going to disappear when those people get tired of coming out and dancing or, or, or no longer able to dance. And I think that we've got an awful lot of clubs like that. And so I don't know what the answer is because the red flag that I hear in that type of thing is, is that there's, there's, there's no new blood coming in. 
You know, the, the story I hate to say is, is that uh, when my wife and I got into square dancing in 1982, we were the youngest in the room. Too many times we're still the youngest in the room, and it's, you know, we're a couple years older at least. And, and so it, 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 it comes back to part of that problem is that there is still a, a group of people that really enjoy this activity and want to dance, and there's a group of people that really enjoy this activity and want to call, but we're really not growing it because it comes back to that maintain, maintaining, recruiting, promoting, all those other things. We haven't figured out how to solve that yet. Um, so I'm not telling you a solution here, but it, but it, um, uh, if you've got that situation of a club where the leadership is tired on both the caller and the club side, the caller and the club still need to talk about so how do we acknowledge that and is there a way to regain some of that passion because I think that's what you have to have to grow something. Gene? I had a thought on it, and then it just went out my mind. Connie and I have never been a member of a caller-run club. We've always been where we had leaders in our club that operated it. And I think the problem, if it's a caller-run club and he's got more than just that one club, he's not going to take time to spend trying to build that particular club. And he'll just accept what what comes in as long as you get enough to pay the rent and, and he makes, you know, clears expenses and everything. But I think really, and no, no disrespect to Larry, but I think the best clubs are the ones that are run by the dancers. I wouldn't disagree with that. You know. Yeah. And the thing that we have, you have to remember that the caller himself is just your employee. You have actually hired him. And if you turn over the uh, rings of that club to him, uh, You've lost all control of it. It would be just like uh, having a business and let your, you know, let somebody run it for you and everything. So I really, I like to see the lead, uh, dancers lead that club. And again, as Larry said, when the passion goes away, then the club goes. And there was no disrespect taken because I actually absolutely agree with you. The only thing I might expand on is is the idea of, of the caller being the employee, and that is correct. Uh, but that doesn't get in the way of there being an effective working partnership between the caller and the club. Uh, the the club brings certain attributes to the table for the growth of that club. As I mentioned before, the caller, depending on their experience, can help that club that dancer leadership realize uh, their best and because they're able to draw upon not just the employee's calling talent, uh, but the employee's knowledge of the long time, in some cases, long time knowledge of the business. Um, I uh, mentioned that I was a local caller, three clubs. I mentioned I'm also pretty busy with my day job. And I would absolutely agree. The the uh, I'll I'll take care of trying to provide the best program I can provide, so that people coming into the hall that night have a great time, and and think it was their and, and not think, but know that it was their best night of entertainment that week. But in terms of growing the club or uh, um, uh, uh, developing the 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 uh, sociability of the club or the culture of the club or all those things that make a really fabulous club. Uh, that's best left to the people that are, you know, most, uh, qualified to do that. And by and large, uh, that is the, that is the dancer leadership organization of that club. Um, my, um, um, obligation in my sense as a caller for a club is, is that I want to be compatible with, additive to, value added to that culture. I don't want to be at odds with that culture because that culture, you know, it really doesn't matter uh, to a certain extent. It really doesn't matter which guy or gal is up there with a microphone in hand. Uh, that club is going to be successful with the best calling in the world or mediocre calling in the world or the crummiest calling in the world if that club has desire to be there, wants to be together as friends, wants to be socializing, all those other factors is why they're there. Uh, you know, Sure, a good calling experience adds to it, but it doesn't make up for what the club does not bring to the table in terms of its own viability. One thing you need to remember, too, is as leaders of your club, and it was brought up earlier, uh, when your visitors come in, the visitors to your club is a big important part of it. And you get your visitors to come back by showing some leadership and welcoming them into your club. And the thing that we've seen 
has happened over the years. Some of our dancers cannot wait for that last tip. When that caller starts that last tip, they start cleaning up. And they start folding up chairs. And if I'm at your club and you're folding chairs and I'm dancing the last tip, then I feel like you're trying to run me off. And I, I'm not sure I'll come back very often to your club. So you show leadership by waiting until all the dancers are, the dance is finished. And you can thank them for coming standing at the door. And, uh, and then you'll get them to come back. And that's leadership. Another way of putting that is, is somebody that doesn't know, and we got a hand in the air, great, Connie back there. Another way of putting that is, is a guest may not know your club and your club culture, but maybe they know who was calling that night, and so they came for the calling, but I'll guarantee you they'll only come back because of the club. Yes. Hi, my name is Leah Veronica, and I'm the publisher, editor of a Square Dance magazine, The Open Squares for Southern California. And I'm also going to be putting on a presentation this afternoon about recruiting. And I want to respond to your statement about cleaning up the hall before the last tip is over. I don't agree with that. That could possibly fall under his, his question also of nobody wants to do anything. Because if the, uh, the committee who is responsible for the refreshments can't put the stuff away until the end of the dance and everybody else has gone for a coffee at a restaurant, they're left out. They were the workers for the evening and they've done the work and now they're left out. I think that during that last tip to put away the coffee and the water, whatever needs to be done and quietly, like we do at our club, those people are at the door saying good night. So you may you said something very. First of all, thank you for speaking up because none of this, you know, we're not none about nobody's here trying to say we have the absolute truth. And mm-hmm. and, and if I look at what Gene said, which I happen to agree with, and I look at what you said, and I happen to agree mm-hmm. with, you're going to say, well, so who do you actually agree with? Mm-hmm. But the if fact you that, were talking about well, New Year's Eve, if you were talking about yeah. New Year's Eve, where you have to wait until the dance is over to take down decorations right. and stuff like that, I would totally agree with sure. you to wait. But at a regular dance where all you have is your coffee, water, the few items. Yeah. yeah. So I, what I'm trying to I, – I thank you, appreciate that very much. But what I'm saying is you have to think about what it is you're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. And what Gene is talking about trying to achieve is is that giving those guests an experience that they feel welcoming. Mm-hmm. What you're trying to achieve is making sure that your guests are both welcome, feeling welcomed and there, but also to be respectful of your members who are volunteering their time. And so whether you come up with an ex- – you know, it comes back to what are your values in your club and what is your what is your culture and, and how do you want to handle it in your club, if you understand what the goal is that you're trying to achieve, you both are trying, in my opinion, trying to achieve the same goal, but the solution or the tactic may look a little different depending on the situation. And so uh, what you're really looking for is, is, so how does that work in your club so you try to meet that? Another hand in the air. A possible solution to that might be... Um, Number one, to wait. Uh, who are you and where are you I'm from, sorry. please? Linda Maris from San Diego. Um, to wait until the tip has actually started to clean up, not when the caller's squaring up, but when they've actually started. And if a square needs filling, to jump in um, and then start putting away the refreshments after it's it's started. I think it's definitely runs people out the door if you're tidying up before the music's even really started. Yeah, and and we did this at one of my clubs. It's, a, you know, it, it's the same problem of how do you uh, keep the atmosphere you want to keep and still be respectful of the folks that are volunteering. And and with it, it wasn't that big a, a big a thing as what we solved is we just look for a way to make sure that we didn't give the appearance of okay it's over get out of here uh, and we tried to make sure that how we went about it and the timing did not interrupt with the filling the squares I think that's what you're saying the filling the squares and the ability of the people who are dancing maybe that last tip are having a great time but you, this is the kind of thing where I still think you know it, it's a partnership between uh, the caller uh, and and the club leadership as to what are we trying to achieve, what is it we're trying to do, and then how do we go about doing it? If you if you if you get into the um, 
discussion of what do we do first, and but you don't really know what you're trying to achieve, uh, then the solutions may not represent themselves. Uh, in my business life, I work with teams that are are uh, creating materials of, of, of education, if you will, for – well, it's a, it's a pharmaceutical business. And so how we tell what we know to uh, patients and physicians. And we have a committee that, uh, um, that is responsible for making sure that we're doing something in the right way. And so you can set up a situation where the marketing department obviously has an idea of what they want to do. And unfortunately, in a regulated business, the regulators are going to have an opinion and the legal people are going to have an opinion. And the way you find solutions in those kind of situations is, is that, okay, what is it you're trying to achieve? If you say to the marketing folks, what is it you're really trying to achieve, then how they were going about it may not have made sense, but something else did make sense. And so I would encourage you to think about any time you're in one of those kind of discussions and trying to figure out what you're trying to do, step back and say, so what is the bottom line? What is it we want to achieve? And I think you'll come to the solution that you've come to in your club in your situation may come to the solution in another situation that Gene talks about or something in between. But if it's right for the club, it makes the guests welcome uh, and it doesn't disrupt the dance and it's and it's fair to the volunteers, then you've found the right solution for your club. And I think uh, whether that facilitation of that leadership, if you will, from the, uh, the club leadership or whether they're from the caller or some kind of a partnership, it's that kind of leadership that helps those kind of solutions be found. I'm not sure how it is out in California, but back home, our visitors are a big part of our club. And if we didn't have good visitor participation, we would probably be financially unable to continue our club without raising our dues considerably. So we try to maintain it where that our visitors know they're welcome to the club. And we try not to show that we're trying to run them off, so to speak. Uh, I've been to clubs where the dancers will just sit, they will stay in the kitchen. They don't come out and participate. Well, that tells me that maybe I don't need to go back to that club because they're too busy back in the kitchen. And we have refreshments at our club, and we assign two couples or couples volunteer to bring the refreshments at night. And they wait until after we finish or after that last tip starts, and they'll move the refreshments out. But we don't start taking up the chairs and things until all of our, until it's over. Because our caller normally puts everybody in a circle after the dance, after the last tip, and does a left element, and then you just weave the ring and tell everybody good night. So we try to have everybody up dancing on our last tip, and I think this shows good leadership with your club. So are there other topics that we might want to comment on? I mean, if somebody wants to keep that conversation going, that's okay, but I think we may have put enough stuff on the table there. I saw a hand in the air, or you've got the microphone. you got the first hand in the air. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, John Maris, uh, San Diego, California. J- just just to put a punctuation mark on, on that, I, you know, are we concentrating on the I, – I think the important thing is are we concentrating on the people or the process? You know, we're all involved in various um, roles in making the club dance run as far as refreshments, decorations, and things like that. What, you know, what are we, what are we focused more on? Are we focused on the process of running our dance or on the people that came to the dance? Um, and I think it's actually a combination. You're trying to have the processes in place that will serve the people at your dance in your, in your environment, in your culture. Um, just, just to kind of back step a little bit, I, as far as a caller club relationship, what I always, what I always think of it as is, um, more of the relationship maybe between the, the pastor and a congregation of a congregational run church, as I, I tend to, to make parallels of that. The, and for those that aren't familiar, what, what are the attributes of a con- congregational run church? Well, the, 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 it's composed of church officers and a board, and they hire their pastor. Great. And, Super. and the pastor, um, serves, you know, as, as sort of the out front person. Great. So that, that sort of gives the background level for the people in the room and anybody okay. listening to the table will know what you're, where you're coming from. That's great. So go ahead. Um, you know, obviously there has to be a fit philosophically, re- regardless of the, 
the ability of the caller is is do the do the philosophies fit and um, you know yes the caller is an employee but I think you know a, a, a symbiotic or or equal relationship I think uh, is best uh, but obviously a strong dancer run club I agree with you is um, is best. Um, most of the caller run clubs in our area are actually more advanced and challenge clubs. So the dancers are there for a different thing at that point. Great. We had another hand in the air just right right there. Uh, Pat Herndon, uh, Poway, California, North San Diego County. Um, I guess we'd probably beat that thing before, but I just want to say one thing uh, as far as the, hope usefully. <laughs> the, the cleaning up part. Uh, in our area, uh, facilities costs are very expensive. Sometimes we're paying $42 an hour for the dance hall. And in order to get the, the most amount of dancing in, uh, you know, we try to keep the last tip going as long as possible, but yet we have to be out of the building by a certain time. And so that sort of necessitates starting to clean up during the last tip, even though that's not what we would like to do. Sure. And I think uh, since almost everybody in our area does that, the uh, you know the dancers don't feel like they're being shoved out the door. They just recognize that they're, they're going to get more dancing in by people starting to clean up during the last tip rather than chopping it off you know, 20 minutes early so that we can clean up after they leave. And, and so that's why I'm saying on this particular topic, I don't think there's one single answer. There may be one single thing you're trying to achieve, what you're doing best to serve your people, your members, and your guests. And in a situation like Gene talks about, if your guests are your lifeblood, you don't want to do anything in your area that will will send them away to somebody else. And so it, it just comes back to a lot of factors can, can be on the table as to what you need to consider with what's going to work right for your club. That's one of the reasons when I think about, you know, you know from here you'll get this idea of how to run a club. From here you'll get this idea of how to run a club. From over here, and for the tape, I'm pointing in three different directions, uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll get another idea. And, and what I'd like people, when they hear these ideas, is to try to drill down from a leadership point of view, to try to drill down and understand, well, what is it you're trying to achieve? And in that particular situation, why was that the solution that worked? And in another situation, why was this the solution that worked? And in another situation, why was this the situ- uh, solution that worked? Because I, kinda, I think it's going to be so much more valuable for you to consider in leadership situations and in, in, instead of sort of missing the point and saying, well, that won't work in my area, but if you understand why it works in their area, why it's important in their area, it might give you something valuable in terms of how to better understand why what will work in your own area. Other hands in the air? We've still got uh, 15 minutes that we can uh, entertain you. I hope we're entertaining you a little bit. Uh, Lori Tucker again. Um, one of the things we've done in two of our clubs, and I'd be interested in, in uh, thoughts on uh, your clubs, uh, as leadership, I think one of the principal uh, obstacles we face is to grow our clubs. Um, you know, you don't want the membership to decline to the point where, where uh, you, your club ultimately folds. One of the things we've done is in each of our clubs, we've set aside one uh, week a month where we uh, have open introductions so that uh, anybody could even walk in off the street. And we will call a tip or two uh, of, you know, just real steak and potatoes, basic mainstream, circle right, circle left, alaman left, um, right and left grand, to, to give them a little flavor for the basics of square dancing. And uh, we're just curious as to uh, whether any other clubs do that, uh, the amount of success you've had, or uh, what are you specifically doing within your clubs to, uh, to, to build your club up? Now, I can't relate directly, and I'll look for other hands in the air. I can't directly relate to exactly how much success we've had at it, but what you basically said is it's, again, you know, what's your club culture and what are you interested in? Any club I've got, no matter what the level, and I've got, well, now I've got uh, just the one group, and it happens to be, it's interesting. I kept the group that's closest to the house, but actually the program I, is, is not my most favorite to call. It's an advanced club. Now, I'm not saying anything negative about advanced. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> uh, but I've had, so I've called for for mainstream clubs, plus clubs, and advanced clubs. But the advanced club is, is a nice example of what you're talking about because if we get guests that wander into that club, 
I don't care what level they call, what level they, they, they dance. We're not going to say to them, oh, you don't dance advanced, you're not welcome here tonight. We'll never say that. I will alter with the club's permission because that's our culture and that's our leadership and that's our agreement. I will alter the program so that there's a little bit of something for everybody in that evening. Now, you know, I, I don't do it necessarily as a recruiting tool. Uh, it may help grow the club. It may not. It depends. Uh, sometimes you've just got people passing through. You know, they, they heard about your club. They wanted a place to dance. But what you do get out of that is it's fun for everybody. And it's fun for the people that came and joined you. And so I, I personally would, would say that, that that's one of the things, if we're really catering to the people in this activity, that's one of the things you can do. Uh, the club that I did retire from in San Francisco, which was a plus club, uh, because of its location in San Francisco, uh, we would tend to get um, out of town, way out of town visitors, folks coming in from overseas and whatnot. And we would, you know, and we'd get people coming in there from uh, areas where main, mainstream was a robust program. And it was not even thought second. If if people were going to come, even if we didn't know about it ahead of time, it didn't really matter. If people walk in the door that night, um, I'll ask them, so where do you dance? What programs do you dance? Not for the purpose of, de- of, of deciding whether they are qualified to dance with us that night, but so I know what program I'm supposed to call that night. And, and that's what that club's culture was, is to welcome anybody that walked in the door, no matter what their level was. Uh, we've had situations in those clubs, and what I feel Philosophically agree with. If we get people who have never danced before to walk in the door, I'll do a tip of, of first night stuff to get them in there and see and, and see what they have. Then you've got to be able to follow that up with, though, if they're local guests, that you've got a program, a class, or something, so that you, the worst thing in the world is, you're in January. Thanks for coming out. Could you come back in September? <laughs> so if you want to grow your club with that kind of thing, you have to figure out. So. How do you allow them to come back immediately? And I'm, I don't, you know, I don't know what those answers are. Was there another hand in the air, or did you want to react to that, Gene? Where our club is located in Charlotte, uh, it's not out on the mainstream, so we don't get a lot of drop-ins. But we do encourage our class, uh, once they've had two or three lessons, we encourage them to come by the club. And we get, they will, we'll have a couple or two couples will stop in. And our caller will do a, a tip or maybe sometimes two tips with what they have learned up to that point. And we hope this will encourage them to continue the class and also it indoctrinates them into the club. And so when they do graduate and they come to the club, they know some people there. So they're not just, they haven't had 20 or 30 weeks of classes and now they're a member of the club, which they know no one except for the few angels that came out and worked. So, uh, I guess a couple of weeks ago we had we have a couple that homeschools their their two daughters and they're going through the class and it it gives them some of their physical education uh, classes that they have to have and one is sixteen and one is fourteen and for some reason their parents were tied up and but they wanted to come to the club so Jean and Betty Baker our caller they brought them there and there's They've learned so well in the 10 weeks that they danced three tips with our dancers, our club members, and they actually danced better than some of our club members. And uh, they had a great time, so they're wanting to come back again. So we hope that this will encourage the class to not feel awkward about coming into to the, to the club when they fit, do finish and graduate. Okay, Pat Herndon, uh, Poway, California. Uh, what our club is doing this year is an experiment to uh, to try to to encourage the class to to you know, integrate into the club. Is on our Friday night dances. Uh, our club is a, f- a full plus club. First off, our Friday night dances. Uh, our class level starting uh, at the first of the year. Our classes start in September, and all of the Friday night dances since the first of the year are class level m- moving up as the class progresses. The Saturday night dances are still full plus. And it's hopeful, and that'll integrate the uh, the classes in. And we've also invited all of the other classes in uh, North San Diego County, or actually all over the world, to come uh, to that. And we've been running, I understand, eight to ten squares at the Friday night dances. Other comments or questions? Yes, hand in the air. Cheryl Edgington, Los Angeles, California. I am the partner. Uh, 
Sylvester Nealon is the caller. And we started our club. We're coming up on 22 years for our anniversary uh, in June. And our job was really just to get the club started. We don't consider ourselves a caller-run club. Sylvester understands very well that he's a hired employee. (laughs) <laughs> and tries to stay out of the mix whenever possible. But our job as far as leadership is because we have been in square dancing 26 years, and so we're the oldest, not in age, but as far as knowledge in the square dancing. And so, therefore, people in the club come and ask us questions, and so we try to lead them because we have been around and done a lot of things in square dancing. It's interesting listening to all the things that you were saying because most of those we are doing. And so I feel very good that we're doing the right thing. (laughs) But you're describing a partnership. Right. Yeah. And uh, currently, well, when we started the club, I was the first president, and I was president six years. And I really wanted to get out of it because there were other things that we had to do. But you know how people put you in a job, they want you to continue to do it because nobody else wants to do anything. So I finally changed the Constitution and bylaws so that you couldn't run after two years, uh, two terms. Term limits, okay. Right, so therefore <laughs> that put me out. However, I am currently the vice president again are there in any the term, club. Are, are there any term limits on that? Well, no. Well, yeah, just two years, just two years a, a term. But um, the reason I did that, and I shared this with Leah because we've had a conversation not too long ago about this, was we had a terrible president who was an ogre and ran a lot of our members away. And since it was a club that I started, I wanted to see it continue. So I really got someone else to be the president. But I said, I'll I'll have your back. I'll be your vice. Because I wanted to pull people back in. So I really don't want to be a leader, but just because people constantly come and ask you questions because you have the experience, you try to lead in that way. That's an interesting comment. You really don't want to be a leader, but you also are acknowledging that because of your position in that club, you are a leader whether you want to be or not. Right. And I think that's a topic we didn't really, we didn't really touch on, particularly for callers. You need to be a, you you need to be, know that you're a leader, uh, uh, whether you want to be a leader or not. Uh, club officers, I mean, the dancers have a choice. They can get involved in leadership positions or not get involved in leadership positions. So, you know, Gene might give me a perspective on the mic and when I hand it here to him on, on that aspect. From a caller's point of view you ha- or a caller's partner's point of view, uh, working together as a couple for the success of that club because, you know, whether you're the hired employee or not, you're still interested in the success of that club, not just so they pay you but so that you're having fun together. Um it, you have to decide then what type of leader you want to be, what what your leadership needs to be. And and Jean t- touched on it earlier on. You don't have to be necessarily a jumping up and down leader, um, but you can be a quiet leader. But leadership in your case is providing some of that historical perspective and some of that guidance that you've gained from the years that you've been involved to help guide those people in leadership positions to make better to make better judgment. To, to find better solutions. But I think everybody in this room, uh, particularly the callers and partners, must know that whether you want to be or not, you're a leader. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Also to show our leadership, uh, we have a newsletter. And Sylvester writes tips for dancers. And so that gives them some background, you know, the callers telling them some things that they can do to make them successful dancers. And then I just write a editorial about things that I see and things that I want to express to them. So right. we try to come back. I'm going to give them but a... But Sylvester is the instructor. Yes. So that part he does for the class, and we let him call maybe twice a year. You let him call. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give the microphone here to Gene, and then we got a hand in the air. Connie will get it back. You made one comment that uh, I found interesting because I've seen it happen over the years. A caller can run your dancers off. Your leaders, your president can run your caller or your dancers off. I've seen it happen both times, both ways. So in this case, I think if it's the caller that's, if it's the caller that's doing this, then I think the officers have to go to it. If it's the officers that are doing this, then I think it goes back to the caller 
needs to come and talk with the officers, officers and explain, you know, what they're doing. So it goes both ways there. But, you know, I've seen dancers run off both ways. So it is a leadership problem. Isn't it? Yes. I, I think for this question, I want to be anonymous on the tape. But um, we heard your voice earlier, so they will not stop. <laughs> What do you do when your club leadership stagnates? We have a situation where we have term limits, but had to vote to ignore them and have pretty much crowned our club president, um, who's been president for probably 20 years now, because maybe 15, um, because nobody else wants to take the job. Nobody else wants to do refreshments. Nobody else wants to do whatever. The board's pretty much the same as it has been. And the one or two people who might be willing to take on the president's job, the club doesn't want to vote in. So the club's just kind of stagnating. What do you do? A uh, very real situation. I'm not sure where to start on that one. because, it, But it, it's... Sometimes there's not a whole lot you can do, but you, you, it, it, when I uh, approach those kinds of problems, if you will, I, I still try to step back and try to figure out what it is we're going to try to accomplish. What are the data? What are the facts we've got in order for us to do? In your case, you've got stagnating leadership. Um, you're, you obviously don't have new people coming in, or you've got some people the club doesn't accept. And part of the thing you can start to explore is, well, why don't they accept them? Uh, and, and I'm not asking for you to tell us here why they why you don't accept them, but if, if it, it, it's got to still, um, and, and you're the caller, right, caller partner, uh, you, that's still one of the places. Where, and, but you're the hired the hired hand, so to speak. Okay, uh, but you still have to acknowledge that you're leaders, and so to a certain extent, it's working with and through the club leadership to maybe understand some of those things. You're not in a position to step in and say you should do this and you should stu- do that. But you can begin a, you know, help the club have a conversation perhaps, uh, to explore some of what's going on. Um, oftentimes a tool for, uh, starting those kinds of, of discussions isn't so much, I think that, to make a statement, I think this or I think that, but is to ask a question. Uh, uh, almost you're, you're moving into the consultant basis, if you will. And, and one thing, if anybody works with consultants, consultants are very good at is asking questions. But you may be able to, to ask the questions that will have will have the club leadership have the right kind of conversation to see what are the possible things for us to do if if you can at least establish we want to continue to grow our club if 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 you can't establish that then I'm not sure where you are but if you can establish what are the real goals between yourself and the club leadership for where you're trying to go it opens up possibilities of questions to ask is to understand well what might be some ways we can approach that and and you may find as you go through that exercise that some solutions that don't occur now start to bubble up but it, 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 you know oftentimes you start on one of these leadership adventures where you really don't know where it's going but if you have a sort of a general idea maybe you know what questions to ask that will help you understand a little bit more. It's a corny analogy, but uh, um, uh, once you start out uh, you know, from San Francisco heading for New York, uh, you know, you've got to sort of stay on the path to get there. There's all kinds of possibilities of how to get there, but you've got to explore all the possibilities to say, this is the way we want to go. That may not help you, but it's at least maybe a tool of where to start. Anybody else last? And we're coming up on time, so about one more. Okay. You, you didn't say this straight out. And and so maybe if you didn't, you can correct me. Go ahead. <laughs> but it, I'm, this is Art Parks again from Co- Covina. Um, where you have a situation where you have a president that's been the president of the club for 20 years, you got another red flag situation uh, where when that person does in fact go down, it looks like it's the end of the organization. Uh, who's, who's the successor is what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Nobody's, nobody's gotten any experience unless there's standing committees or something of people that will, that, uh, somebody's had enough and seen what goes on and is interested in taking over. In, in that instance, then you're maybe okay, uh, if there's somebody in the wings. But, but I think you have to look and make sure there's somebody in the wings, and if there isn't, 
there's a big problem. Well, you point out ahead. a couple of great things. One is it obviously is a red flag, and so you have to deal with that. And the other thing is just thinking about what you're saying here. When you think about the other people that nobody would vote them in, part of the reason, well, I wonder why they wouldn't vote them in. Is it because of their fit? Is it because of their lack of experience or something? And so if you've got at least a robust enough situation that future leaders get a job here, a job there, a job there to start to get some experience in club leadership, that's what's growing your successors. I think, uh, except for Jean that I want to turn the microphone to, I think Jean's got the last comments because our hour's up. I think it all goes back to one word. Communications from the caller to the dancers so that they both know which way they're going and what they want to do for that club. But Larry mentioned one thing. If I had a pre- uh, if there was someone in the club that had been president for a long time and nobody liked him, and we had two people that would take it but nobody would elect them, I would want to find out, you know, what the problem is there with the couples that nobody wanted. And that would probably drop back into the leadership or the, Maybe just the group as a whole, maybe a, how the, you know, teams will have a um, team meeting with just the dancers to find, you know, with just the players and they'll find out what's wrong with it. And that may be where your club needs to go is just to sit down and say, okay, which way are we going and why? And I think that's the big question. It just, and I think the word is communications all the way around. I think that's a great final word. would like to thank everybody for being here today. I hope we have kept you awake for the full hour. Um, thank you, Gene, for your participation. Connie, thank you for moving the microphone around the floor. And thank you, everybody else that uh, was willing to raise their hand and get on the microphone. Have a good afternoon.